I'm still recording here from my hotel room in Las Vegas, and the podcast I did on Monday still had some audio problems, so I made some adjustments to my mic here, so hopefully we've got even better quality this time than we did the last time. You know, the markets continue really to ignore all of the overwhelming bad news, and bad news on the economy, bad news on the corporate earning front or retail sales. I mean, you name it, the news is bad, but the markets seem to shrug it off. And I'm talking about all the markets, the equity markets, the foreign exchange markets, bond market, the gold and silver market. I mean, sure, there's usually a knee-jerk reaction. We get some bad news and gold spikes up, um, the, the dollar dumps, but then you know it recovers what it lost and gold surrenders it gains. And we continue to hold the cores because to me, the bad news isn't sinking in. And yes, the markets are going down. The stock market has been trending down, particularly the NASDAQ. But it really hasn't rolled over. I mean, yes, we did have a big drop yesterday. We had the Dow was down about 200 points. But that's because it was up 200 points the day before. So basically over the two days, we didn't go anywhere, despite the fact that we continue to get bad news. And I'll start with some of the bad news that came out today, and then we'll work backwards. I think probably the worst news of the day was the weekly unemployment claims, which have now finally started to move higher. In fact, this is the third week in a row where unemployment claims have moved up. And in fact, everybody was looking for a drop in claims this week because of the gains that we had last week, last month, or last week, rather, it was 274,000. And the expectation was for a better week with claims dropping to 267,000. Instead, we tacked on an extra 20,000. We moved up to 294,000, almost back up to 300,000. We might get to 300,000 next week at the rate we're going. But this is now the highest level for weekly jobs of claims in 15 months. You know, that's more than a year. And in fact, if you take these last three weeks and look at that together, this is the biggest three week spike in unemployment claims in 11 years. So, you know, this goes even before the, the 2008 financial crisis to find this kind of this kind of jump. Now, in addition to that, we got the Bloomberg Consumer Comfort Index came out today. Last uh, last time we got it was at 42. Now it's slipped again to 41.7. This is the least confident the consumer has been in five months. So, again, more evidence that the economy is weakening. And of course, look what happened on Tuesday. Bernie Sanders chalked up another primary victory, right? These are voters who are unhappy with the state of the economy. If they were happy, they'd be voting for Clinton because she's continuity. She's more of the same. Well, if the economy was as good as Obama claims it is, or even as the Fed is pretending it is, why don't people want more of it? The reason they're willing to take a chance on a socialist, the reason that all the Republicans are taking a chance on a populist or really buying a pig in a poke because they really don't know what Trump is going to do. They just know that he's different than what we already got. And what we don't want is more of the same because what we got now is awful. And if the economy were good, people would want to continue that. They wouldn't want to risk rocking the boat. It's only because things are so bad that they're willing to try anything uh, to try to fix it. But, you know, the, the worst news, I think, is just coming out of the retailers. I mean, the retail sales numbers we're getting are awful. Look at what happened with Macy's yesterday, which actually crushed a lot of the other retailers, uh, even though the overall averages are still holding up, although not necessarily yesterday. But Macy's sales were horrible. The stock got crushed. I think it was down about 15 percent yesterday. It was down again today a little bit. Uh, so to a new 52-week low, it's just over 31. But the 52-week high on Macy's? was 73.6. So the stock has been more than cut in half. Uh, look at the Gap also reporting bad numbers. Now they're going to be shutting down some Banana Republic or Old Navies. Or stock was down almost 4% today, closing at 17.86. 52-week high on that stock, 39. 39.59. It's down at 17. That's more than a 50% decline. And it's not just these stores. This is happening all over the place. And I know a lot of people want to just say, oh, well, this is because of online, right? People are buying online. Well, that's not the case. I mean, first of all, Macy's has a pretty good e-commerce uh, business. So, you know, they sell on the Internet. But 
internet sales are rising, but not nearly as much as brick and mortar sales are falling. So sales are still going down. Sure, Amazon is taking market share probably away from these guys online. It is hard to compete with them, but in aggregate, companies are selling less. In fact, if you look at the uh, inventory levels reported by Macy's, they're reporting their highest amount of unsold inventory ever, ever. That would include the Great Recession. You know, we know that the inventory to sales numbers in general are high. In fact, we got more inventory numbers on Tuesday. Wholesale inventories were still at a very high. I think it was 1.36 or something inventory to sales. We're still sitting at the highs that we haven't seen since the Great Recession. But it's even worse over at Macy's. And, and think about this, because oil prices are now rising. In fact, oil closed above $47 a barrel today. This is the highest close of the year. And oil was even up yesterday, even with the Dow down 200 points. You know, so much for that correlation. In fact, I remember when you had all these traders on CNBC wishing for higher oil prices because they thought it was going to be good for the stock market. And I always said, be careful what you risk for uh, because it's not good for the stock market. It's good for oil stocks. Sure. High oil prices are good for oil stocks, but it's not good for the economy. And think about these retailers. If stores like Macy's and The Gap weren't able to sell products when their customers had the benefit of cheap gasoline, because the money they didn't spend on gas, they had extra money to spend on clothing. Well, if they didn't have extra money for clothing with cheap gas, what's going to happen when gas is more expensive, which is happening? Gas prices are rising, and I think they're going to rise a lot higher as the price of oil goes up because the value of the dollar is going to go up. Now, the dollar hasn't taken a big drop recently, the last week or so, despite we, the fact that we've had all this bad economic data. But I think people are still in a state of denial. People are still pretending that this data is temporary, uh, that the recovery is still on track. In fact, I read this article today. They were saying, well, you know, we think the Fed is not going to hike rates in, in June. We think now it's going to be September. And the funny part about the article, and it was also based on a survey, was that the rationale, supposedly, for the delay in the rate hike was inflation being too low, which is completely ridiculous because inflation is not too low. In fact, inflation is one of the only things that's rising other than maybe unemployment claims. If you look at the core CPI, the year-over-year -year core CPI, that's already above the Fed's target of 2%. What's really delaying the rate hike is the weakness in the economy. It's the fact that the job market is slowing down. GDP growth has slowed down. That's what's delaying it. But nobody wants to admit that. Everybody wants to pretend we still have a great economy and we would love to be raising rates, but we can't because just, you know, that pesky inflation rate is just too low and it's stopping us from raising rates. Look, if the economy was good, they would raise rates because low inflation is also good. The lower, the better. Low inflation is not a bad thing. Right? Somehow it's going to jeopardize the recovery. If anything, low inflation will help sustain the recovery even more. So this is all just a smokescreen to cover up what's really going on. And again, it's not really a delay. They're not delaying the rate hike. They've called it off. In fact, they didn't even want to raise rates the first time. They backed themselves up into that credibility corner because everybody was saying, well, you know, if the Fed doesn't raise rates, what do they know? What are they not telling us? What are they afraid of? Yeah, they were afraid. That's why they're waiting until December. And in fact, by December, they felt they had no choice. So to prove they weren't afraid, they raised rates, even though they were probably petrified, which is why they waited so long. And now, you know, when the market got off to the worst start in the history of the stock market, uh, you know, they had to backtrack. But they're still pretending that there's rate hikes coming when the reality is the next move by the Fed is probably going to be to cut rates to zero. In fact, Janet Yellen still says that she hasn't ruled out negative rates. They're still dumb enough to consider that. And we're going to have uh, more quantitative easing. That is what is coming. But the market still hasn't figured that out yet. Now, we'll see. I mean, maybe tomorrow's bad news, if we get bad news on retail sales for April, will be the economic straw to break that camel's back. And maybe we'll finally see the dollar roll over and gold pick up if we get a weak number. We'll see. I mean, the market is looking for a strong number, as they always do. You know, no matter how many bad numbers we get, they're always expecting a good one, and they're always surprised when they don't get it, right? Almost the definition of insanity. The uh, retail sales in March were weak. They were minus 0.3. 
They're expecting a big jump in April of plus 0.9. Well, we'll see what we get tomorrow. But I can tell you one thing. If we don't get a strong number, if retail sales are down again, all the articles are going to be how it's unexpected, right? An unexpected decline. Same thing, less autos. Uh, last month wasn't too good at, at 0.2, and they're expecting an improvement to 0.5. Well, we'll see. But the question is how much economic, bad economic news can come out, how much bad earnings news can come out, and everybody just shrugs it off. I mean, look at Apple. Apple Computer, down again today, down about 2.7%, managed to stay above 90, but it traded below 90 for the first time in a couple of years. I think it was back in 2014 sometime, the last time Apple was below 90, but it's down about 32% now from its 52-week high. I mean, this is a bellwether stock. In fact, Apple is no longer the most valuable U.S. company. I think now that honor for now is going to Google or Alphabet, which is the, the parent company of Google. Uh, but this was a darling. Everybody loved Apple, and they probably still do. But what is the problem for Apple? It's sales. It's their iPhone sales, and people are afraid of the iPhone 7. Yeah, people don't have money to upgrade to an iPhone 7. They barely have money to buy goods on sale uh, at Macy's or The Gap. They can't even buy T-shirts. How are they going to buy a new expensive phone? I think most people who are underemployed or unemployed will just make their iPhone 6 last a little longer, and that is what people are worried about. But all of this, right, falling retail sales, falling consumer confidence, falling corporate earnings, and now rising unemployment claims, rising announced layoffs. Remember, we were already off to the worst start uh, since the Great Recession in companies announcing their layoffs. You know, there's only one job statistic that still supposedly is improving. We got that on Tuesday, and that was the jolts number. And what that does is it, it shows you job openings, right? How many uh, jobs are available? And this number came out higher than expected. In fact, they revised the prior month higher, and we now have like 5.757 million open jobs. And Janet Yellen has talked about this jolts number as some kind of indication that we have a strong labor market, right? Because we have all these unfilled jobs, and, and employers are just desperate to hire people, and they can't find them, and so they're going to have to start raising wages, right, so they can try to entice people to accept all these jobs that nobody wants. But that doesn't make any sense, because if you actually look at hiring, real hiring doesn't jive with all these supposed job openings. So if employers want so many workers, why don't they actually hire any of them? Now, there's a couple of reasons why that might be the case. One might be they don't have the skills to meet the requirements of these jobs. Well, if they don't have the skills now, they're not going to have them next week, next month, or next year, right? If we don't have the skills that employers need, then those jobs are never going to be filled. So it doesn't matter how many jobs there are available that nobody qualifies for, right? They don't count. Now, I think another problem is that the pay is too low for the jobs that are open. I think a lot of these jobs are part-time jobs at very low pay. And a lot of people either don't want those low-paying part-time jobs, they'd rather just stay on welfare or unemployment or whatever kind of government programs are on, or they just you know, live with their parents and they just assume not work at all because if they get a job, maybe they have to start repaying their student loans for whatever reason. And of course, there may be some people that already have a part-time job and they don't want another one, or they already have two and they don't have room or time. Because when you're like a part-time employer, you have to try to get everybody to work with your schedule, and maybe it's harder. Because when you go from a full-time economy to a part-time economy, obviously there's going to be more positions available. If I'm only hiring part-time workers, right, I'm going to need a lot more part-time workers than if I was hiring full-time workers. And these jolts, jobs openings, they don't differentiate between the number of full-time, you know, whether a job is full-time or part-time. A job's a job as far as the jolt is concerned. So it makes sense that it would be harder to fill some of these part-time positions. But I think to jump to the conclusion that all these job openings means that we have a tight labor market and that wages are about to really spike up because employers are going to have to entice all these workers back into the labor market who are who have left. And even though there's all these jobs opening, they just don't want them. And so they're going to have to pay more and more. This is all a fantasy because if this was going to happen, it would have already happened. We wouldn't still be waiting for it. It's like, you know, waiting for Godot or like Linus sitting in that pumpkin patch, you know, waiting for the great pumpkin. You know, if he was coming, he would have been there a long time ago. 
uh, it wouldn't have forced uh, you know them to, to miss their their trick or treating. So this is all not going to happen. The reality of the jobs market is that it's horrible. I mean, yes, the unemployment rate is low, and I've explained ad nauseum on prior podcasts why that is. And yes, we've created a lot of jobs, but we all know the caliber of those jobs, the quality of those jobs, and again, a lot of those jobs are in the imagination of the statisticians. Because remember, we have the birth-death model, and you know, people just assume that companies are starting up and creating jobs. Well, what if they're not? You see, these guys all believe there's a recovery. Well, they're wrong, but if there were a recovery, then maybe we would be starting up new businesses. But businesses aren't starting up. They're shutting down. And so there's probably a lot more businesses that are dying than being born and so I think we're way overestimating the job creation. And I do believe that one day in the future, they will go backwards and they will revise a lot of these numbers and take away a lot of the jobs. And then we're going to find out that all those numbers were just BS, that we never created all those jobs. It was We just pretended that we were creating them. And also, I read this article that was blaming the sluggish recovery on the fact that Consumers weren't spending enough. I mean, talk about putting the economic cart before the horse or just not even understanding basic economics. I mean, the reason that consumers aren't spending as much is because they're broke. Now, this guy that wrote this article noted that the savings rate had been picking up and he was upset. He said, look, you see, if we didn't have the extra savings, if consumers were spending more and saving less, if they were using their credit cards more and going deeper into debt, then we would still have more economic growth. And therefore, you know, the problem is us. It's not the Fed. It's Americans. They're just, they just desired, decided not to shop, right? We're being more timid uh, with our spending and our credit cards. And that's why the economy is weak. I mean, talk about ridiculous Keynesian nonsense. First of all, the reason that American consumers are not spending as much now is because they're broke. It's the weak economy that's causing the reduction in spending, not the reverse, but also the reason that Americans are spending less now is because they spent so much more in the past because they didn't save because they bought so much using credit cards. They pulled forward consumption from the future to the present, which is now the past because we've arrived in the future and now we're having to suffer. I always said that we were indulging ourselves. We were pulling forward our consumption. The consumption that we had was at the expense of a reduction in consumption later when we had to pay the bills. Well, now that's what's happening. So to say, well, it's because we're not spending enough. Of course, this was the consequence of all the extra spending that this guy was so excited about. He just wants to continue forever, right? But it can't continue forever because ultimately the bills come in. You have to reduce your spending. Now, had we spent less in the past, had we saved money instead, then we'd have a healthier economy and we could spend more now. In fact, had consumers spent less in the past and saved money, and had interest rates been higher so they could have earned a better rate of return on their savings, they would be in a much better position to save. And of course, we'd have better jobs because if we actually had savings, we would have more capital investment. We'd have more productive workers. They'd have better tools. They'd have better equipment. They'd, we'd be producing more stuff. We'd have a more vibrant economy. That is how economies grow. You save, you underconsume in the present, and the reward is that you get to consume more in the future. But if you do what we did, if you take a shortcut, which is induced by the Fed, if instead you go out and borrow to spend a lot of money, you're undermining the economy. Yes, in the short run, all that borrowing gooses the GDP, which is exactly what we did. But the payback is the reduction in GDP in the future because you pulled it forward. And that's where we are. So you can't lament the good old days. Right? You can't be upset at what's happening now and long for the good old days because those weren't the good old days. It was because we indulged ourselves and spent money that we should have saved and borrowed money that we never should have borrowed. Right? It's because we did all that that we're in such a gigantic hole. And we can't get out of the hole by trying to dig the hole even deeper. No, we have to reverse all those bad policies. Yes, we have to consume less. We have to save more. And so we're going to have a lower GDP in the short run. That is the consequence of what we did. But the Keynesians, they still don't want it, right? They still want the drug addict to take more drugs. They see the drug addict going through withdrawal, right? And the solution is, oh, my God, things were so much better when we were still high as a kite. Yes, but the solution is that to get high again, it's to recognize that if you keep taking the drugs, you're going you're gonna to die of an overdose, which is exactly where we're headed. What we need is to be in monetary rehab 
And all these Keynesian economists still don't get that. But as I said at the beginning of the podcast, you know, the markets are still not reacting to what's going on. Right? I mean, the stock market is on the defensive and there are individual stocks that are getting taken out and shot. Uh, but overall, the market seems to be shrugging it off. The dollar is not losing any more ground. Gold is not making any more uh, ground on the upside. I mean, we're still below 1300. The dollar index still hasn't even gotten below 92 again like it did that one time. Uh, and, and it's, again, it's still people are holding out hope. People are still f- refusing to admit what should already be obvious. But, you know, the problem is the people who believe that the Federal Reserve solved the problems, right? They never understood the problems in the first place. That's why they were surprised by the, the 2008 financial crisis. That's why the same people will be even more surprised by the next crisis, which won't just be a, a financial crisis. It will be a currency crisis which is going to be a whole lot worse uh, than, than the financial crisis. Again, I'm here at this uh, Salt Conference, Skybridge Alternative Asset. It's mostly hedge fund types. And again, all these guys are clueless, despite the fact that hedge funds are having a horrible year in, in 2016 because they're all positioned wrong from the bad bets they made in 2015 because they bet on the recovery. They bet on the Fed. They believed Janet Yellen. They believed all the hype about uh, Ben Bernanke. And they were wrong. They just don't know it yet. Right? Just like they were wrong going into the 08 financial crisis, they just didn't know it until the whole thing uh, came collapsing down around them. But then when it happened, they still didn't understand why it happened. That's why they believed that the Fed's cure worked and that the economy was now healthy. If they understood the problem, they would know that the economy is now sicker because they didn't cure us. They made the disease worse. And now all the problems that we had leading up to the 2008 financial crisis, we have those problems in spades. So I do believe that at some point, you know, something's going to happen. One of these, you know, one day, you know, it's going to be one bad earnings report too much or one bad economic report too much. And then we're going to see gold break out through 1300. We're going to see the dollar index break down below 92 and close below 92 and, and head lower. And I do think the stock market is going to go down because bad news is not good news unless the Fed's on board. So if we keep getting bad earnings, the stock market is going to succumb to that unless it believes it has the Fed on its side. Not just about postponing the next rate hike, but calling the next rate hike off, acknowledging that the next move is going to be a cut, not a hike, and bringing QE back on the table. That's what the market needs if it's going to go higher. But that's not what the U.S. economy needs. Yes, that's what this bubble needs. And if the Fed wants to keep the bubble from completely deflating before the November elections, that's what they're probably going to do. But for now, they're hoping that they can hold off until doing that until after the election. They're hoping that Hillary Clinton can win even if the Fed doesn't stimulate. They're hoping that we can still coast through to November because admitting the economy needs stimulus basically takes the the wind out of their sails, Hillary or Obama, because if the economy needs help, that means it hasn't healed. And if the Fed is stimulating, that means the recovery is over. And they don't want Hillary Clinton to have to run for re-election in a recession that everybody acknowledges is here. They want to pretend it doesn't exist. But of course, it's hard to fool the voters. And the, the polls affirm that. And if um, the economy continues to weaken, as I, I think it will, then Trump's got a much better chance of beating Hillary Clinton than just about anybody thinks. And in fact, the polls are already starting to narrow. And now all of a sudden they're tied. It's not this big lead for Hillary Clinton. It's all of a sudden a tie. And I've been saying this the whole time that just the way people were underestimating Trump's ability to win uh, the Republican nomination, they were also underestimating his ability to win the general election. And one of the reasons that they were trying to undermine Trump was by saying, oh, we can't go with Trump because that assures our defeat. Well, Republicans were voting for him anyway, even though everybody said it it means that Hillary's going to win. But now, even after he's the presumptive nominee, the polls are showing that he's even more likely to win. If the polls showed that a few months ago, he would have won the primaries by even larger margins than he did. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. 
It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They're all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is truth in media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed.